Convergence as a theory offers a very straightforward critique of existing corporate governance systems. It states that throughout the West and elsewhere in the world, it has been assumed and generally accepted that the best way of governing a firm is either through bribery or through money, use of money, through rewards, and with, alongside that, monitoring and control. So on one side, you have payments, and ones that control loads of cash, wages, bonuses, etc. Sort of things. And on the other side of it, you have monitoring, control, disciplining, etc. of businesses. And they've actually said that Convergence said, no, this is not the only way of looking at corporate governance. There are many other ways of looking at corporate governance. And once it said that, the argument was then was about, well, are we moving to a system in which we're all using the same one? And we will look at four articles related to this. Four articles we'll look at are a scene. A scene will look at empirical evidence about institutionalization of finance. So what he's actually looking at is practical examples throughout the world where financial models from one country are being used in another. Gwillian takes the position that about corporate governance being embedded within institutional context. So what is the role of the institution? Where is the institution? What is it trying to do? Who owns it? Who serves it? Who pays for it? And he's saying that there corporate governance is embedded and therefore you can have convergence between two similar organizations as in roles that may have been set up very differently but now are doing similar jobs in very different markets you may have one working in for instance the uh, japan will be adopting models that are very similar to the models that have been adopted in the us uk and similar to models that have been not adopted in germany Rhodes and apple dorm reject this and is insist that there is a continuous role for domestic institutions that these are still extremely important. And Branson, finally, that family ownership remains do dominant globally and therefore, in fact, the model that we're considering, which is share owners, people sitting outside the companies, etc., is not relevant simply because this is not actually a major form of ownership. There may be, we have a few big companies in the West that are owned by the shareholder models, FTSE 500, that sort of thing. Sounds like a lot, but in terms of the sheer number, the massive number of corporations that are out there, businesses are out there, it is small beer. So Asim looks at it. What did he come up with? He believed importance about the, the institutions. The institutions across the world wanted to be able to make investments in different parts of the world the institutional investors were discovering wider world of low risk capital and company directors discovery of international source of finance meant that they're directing Japan looking for money instead of just looking for the Japanese banks who may insist on having a seat on the board, might look for investment from America where the investment might come cheaper as it's cheaper and having to give up little less control and all you have to do is make sure that a satisficing supply of money, supply and flow of money goes back to the investors. For this to work, you have to have a way of converting Japanese accounts, Japanese government system, systems, governance systems into something that's understandable to the investors in the West. They want to, you, if you want their money, you have to talk to them in a language they understand and provide different events. So we have a situation in which directors are looking worldwide for finance, institutional in, institutions which are beholden to shareholders that so we use the broad, basic broadly. These could be hedge funds, they could be Berkshire Capital, Berkshire Hathaway, which is owned by uh, Warren Buffet, one of the world's best investors. These all have people they are answerable to, returns they require, investments they require. And therefore it looks on the idea that these directors, they want this money. All these small new capitalists are not particularly bothered about uh, the way that uh, the firms are running on a day-to-day -day basis. They just have general rules about behavior and performance. And so that we have something called classical total convergence theory. That means that everybody is slowly moving in the direction of having exactly the same way of running, same way of keeping things. The work of a scene was non-judgmental, it was positivist. It was not actually trying to say whether it's right or wrong, it was saying this is what's happening. The idea, of course, is that companies would change the way they operated to enhance shareholder returns to shareholders in different countries which required them to operate the same way as other countries did. However, said it, no, the institutional context was important. And what he said was that the law in each country interacts with 
the global culture and the ability the globalization comes along allows us to spread out the world people have different ways of doing things but local law still actually context it and this is what came up with something that he called residual theory he was very cautious on conversions and he said that what actually was happening was residual theory what he meant was that most things would stay in the context of local law enforcement because the local laws had to be obeyed but these legal transitions would interact with national dynamics to create a way of doing business Beyond that, there would, however, be some things that were free to operate, so the lesser things, and he would say these would converge. So, for instance, the way of reporting profits, etc., for local taxation purposes may have to stay the same, but some of the elements of, for instance, the way they traded or the way they actually uh, changed money, etc., could be done in a new area. Those things that were not key to the local culture and characteristics could be allowed to conserve. They were residual to the major work. That is why it's known as residual theory. Gwilin, much more cautious than Osim. Top of this, we have the arts of Rhodes and Appledon. Rhodes and Appledon were not just reporting in the way that Yassim was, and to a lesser extent the way Gwilin was. They had normative arguments. They were saying this is how it should be. They were put it there. They were opposing the arguments of Yassim who was positivist empirically, who say that actually we should not just report, and this is a strong argument in academic, do we just report the way it is or do we argue for the better way of doing it? I hope that those of you, the fact you're listening to this lecture, suggests that you are people who believe that we should be arguing about the best way of doing it, that therefore we should be taking a normative approach. The normative argument was put forward by Rhodes and Appleton that there should be a continuous role mostly for domestic institutions that this argument was in favour of national structures which had delivered prosperity in the past. This is how it is, this is how it should be. As opposed to the idea that this, of arguments of saying this is how it, how, it, uh, how it could be developed, this is uh, where it's going. It was also a normative diversity theory in the fact it was suggesting that the very difference, the very difference between them is a strength. And actually arguing that in certain cases divergence would take place that actually people would play more to their strengths. Which, of course, is work that we'll talk about later as we develop by Branson. What he was also arguing was that there's a, there's a natural difference. And this argument came about and said that, for instance, one thing that is worth bearing in mind was that the German chemical industry, three times the 20th century was destroyed, three times it built it up, and uh, surpassed the UK one. So first we started with the United Kingdom setting up the first global chemistry indust industry. This was overthrown by the US, by the surpassed by Germany as the best European producer of chemicals. The First World War, the German chemicals were destroyed. The UK came back in the interwar period. Uh, but the Germans actually then rebuilt. And uh, by the start of the Second World War, they once again had the most powerful chemical industry. But again, it was destroyed. But after the war, post-war period it again built up and so Rhodes and Apple are saying there must be some reason why the German chemical industry can be literally bombed flat and yet will still come back to surpass uh, other things that's because they have a special skill in this area and therefore their way of running that particular type of industry should be the one that's adopted other comparisons he talked about were things like France nuclear power nuclear engineering tr big trains he talked about the US being specialist in things like software industry that sort of thing. And there were various other things in which he, he identified as being certain local classic cultures were much better, which are much more important for. We had Branson. Branson actually, as I said, rejected converged fear to a greater extent. He argued that the vast majority of local businesses and businesses in number, if not in size, were still family ownership. And there were still some very, very large family ownership he argued it's very culturally insensitive suggest that one size fits all there must be specialist reasons why certain countries did things certain way so in fact he formulated an anti-convergence theory a divergence theory a belief that actually there should be different and better ways of doing it based on the ideas of local cultures which had proved successful in the past 
Right. And there was a final less important reading, which is Martin Rhodes and Bastian vs. Appledorn. It's a discussion of that capital unbound, about people who are both political scientists. They argued about capitalism is diverse and there are national systems, and therefore they should each of them should allow themselves to actually develop those parts of the national system for a good. So the, the part of the national system that gave Germany engineering uh, an advantage should be kept, but then some other parts of it, for instance, maybe in the way of fundraising, financing, it might possibly do different. Again, there might be parts of the French system where you say heavy engineering, trains, that sort of thing, should actually be kept, but they're also at the same time. It's a sub-argument to Gwillian. It's, I would suggest that actually you would be be interesting to actually, if you get do get a chance to look at this, if this is an area you think you might specialise, that you take a look at it and you uh, ask yourself why. I'm not through these tables, but I put them up there because they are available in the reading and I think it's very important for you to be able to familiarize yourselves with them. Basically Rhodes and Appledorn have gone through a large number of institutional contexts and they've looked at how is it done in market orientated Anglo-Saxon, how is it done in network orientated Germanic and Latin. So for instance you might get labour organisation union membership high in the 1980s but then become fragmented, Germanic union membership density high, strong centralised union unions, in Latin, union density generally low, significant decline inside public sector. I mean, that like labour market flexibility, finance from to small firms. All on the ratings, so employee influence, uh, role of banks. There's no. You can look through the books. If you have any questions, you can bring them to us.